of you. So uh, we have here with us uh, Professor P. Krishna Mohan. Uh, he's currently professor at IIT Bombay. Uh, he was the former head uh, of the Center of Studies in Resource Engineering, and uh, he held a chair at IIT Bombay. Um, sir has published a, a lot of uh, papers, uh, interpreted journals, and he's a reviewer of uh, uh, different journals of repute. And uh, his areas of expertise are machine learning, signal processing, uh, image processing, remote sensing, um, uh, to name uh, a few. And he's having wide expertise. Uh, yes, sir. He's having wide expertise in uh, related fields. So um, I think uh, since our uh, uh, workshop is focusing on deep learning, um, his talk will actually set a base for the launch of this workshop. And you all will be keen in interesting the further in attending the further sessions after uh, this uh, um, talk. So uh, and and I have a personal connection with Sir. He's my supervisor and mentor. I'm very proud of that. And uh, thank you so much, Sir, for your kind support and guidance. So um, we will start this session uh, with uh, this workshop with uh, Sir's uh, session and kind words. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for uh, accepting our invite at a short notice. And it's always a pleasure to see you and uh, uh, hear your talks. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Darun. And uh, when you said I had a lot of publications, some of them are thanks to your uh, hard work as a PhD student at IIT Bombay. So you're thanking yourself for it. So let me share my screen. Uh, is my screen visible? Uh, not yet, sir. I think it will. Um, and I said share screen, okay. What about now? Not, not it, sir. Not it. Not yet. Uh -huh. I selected share screen. Uh, multiple participants can share. Okay. Am I given the permission to share my screen? Yes, sir. You are a co-host. So, is there any messages coming, sir? Nothing. Uh, so, okay, okay. I think I may be. I'll have to. Yeah, now it's now it's. Yeah. yeah. Right there you go. <clears throat> well, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Arun, once again, and uh, thank you, Triple uh, IT Three City, for inviting me to uh, deliver this talk immediately after your inauguration. Uh, I'm uh, Krishnamon Budhiraju, a professor at the Center of Studies in Resources Engineering, IIT Bombay. Uh, we are primarily uh, a geoinformatics unit, uh, which is uh, an interdisciplinary unit. So the faculty members here come from uh, varied disciplines. So I'm basically an electrical engineer. Uh, my PhD is in the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Bombay. And I have colleagues who have done their PhDs in computer science, in uh, civil engineering, uh, and so many other allied disciplines. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, analysis of uh, geography related data, whether it is satellite images, whether it is uh, digital maps, whether it is uh, GPS data, uh, whether it is LIDAR data. So a variety of uh, data are analyzed for uh, extracting information about an area uh, and uh, with applications, diverse applications like uh, resources management, uh, environmental monitoring, disaster management, and so on. But my talk as such is 
general in nature, even though the illustrations are from uh, the satellite images. Okay, as far as uh, possible, since it is not uh, being organized by uh, any remote sensing or uh, ge informatics, geomatics related uh, department, I'm trying to keep it as general as possible. The remote sensing images you'll see are only a test bed. <clears throat> Since this is an introductory talk, I have the freedom to uh, give you a little historical introduction. Uh, many of you uh, may not exactly know these uh, details, so I thought it would be interesting. Uh, machine learning as such, it was, uh, the phrase was coined as early as 1952, about 70 years ago, by an IBM researcher by name Arthur Samuel, who had written a program for playing uh, checkers, which is a board game. In those days on mainframes with very little interactive uh, support, in those days, the checkers game was uh, programmed. And the interesting thing was that as the game was played again and again, one side the computer as a player and the other side a human, the computer was able to uh, make better moves with time by observing the way the human players played. So that was kind of uh, a machine that was able to learn by observing or uh, by the examples provided by way of the moves made by the human players. And uh, we all know that uh, in the 1950s, the perceptron came about, proposed by Frank Rosenblatt, and uh, it created a lot of, uh, you know, interest, excitement, and also a kind of uh, false, let us say, or premature uh, hope that ultimately a computer can think or ha can have intelligence as much as a human. And uh, then the Delta rule to train the perceptron was uh, proposed soon after. And its perceptron was used in different applications. But the roadblock came later in the 1960s decade when MIT professors uh, Marvin Minsky and uh, Seymour Papert, they proved that the perceptron has very limited ability. Uh, it could not uh, work when the data were not linearly separable. And uh, in the 70s, there were proposals to use a multiple uh, set of layers of these perceptrons to overcome the problem of uh, the single layer perceptron uh, uh, inability to deal with uh, linearly non-separable data. However, a satisfactory training algorithm was not available and it, it didn't make much headway. And again, another MIT a uh, group of uh, researchers, uh, Rumel Hart, uh, McClelland, and a Canadian, a very famous uh, professor that the world knows, uh, Jeffrey Hinton. So they proposed the backpropagation algorithm to train the multi-layer perceptron network, and the floodgates were open. And, uh, machine learning did not look back after that. <clears throat> so the backpropagation algorithm could train a multi-layer perceptron network and it was used for 
a variety of uh, applications and the visa credit card company made a big investment to uh, use this for uh, you know separating credit card transactions into uh, legitimate and suspicious uh, transactions and it was used in a number of different applications and with the time there were several other related developments like uh, expert systems so rule based expert systems a lot of work was done at stanford university and uh, that led to the setting up of uh, sri international uh, where uh, tremendous amount of uh, expert systems related work was carried out uh, decision trees random forest uh, support vector machine uh, ensemble classifiers so a lot of other related developments happened uh, in the machine learning area that now had uh, firmly entrenched itself as the tool in practically all uh, engineering finance business uh, and other applications and uh, one of the biggest beneficiaries is the natural language processing and machine translation application so if you see some text in any language you feed it to uh, google na uh, translate and you see the english version or whichever language you are comfortable with so the machine learning and subsequent deep learning research had made it uh, possible at least here we have uh, something close to the uh, human uh, expertise in speaking about uh, speaking in any different language and we have seen several uh, examples on television uh, one uh, person speaking uh, on some topic in one language and there was simultaneous translation and including the avatar of that person say something is happening in us a person speaking in us and in japan that an avatar a hologram holographic avatar of that person uh, shown in say tokyo and that person speaks the same content in japanese so that kind of uh, developments have uh, happened so you wouldn't know whether the person uh, was speaking in tokyo and you are seeing it in us or the person is speaking in us and you are seeing seeing it virtually in tokyo it had become that realistic now and uh, ensemble classifiers yeah a a group of weak classifiers can come up with a strong classifier uh this idea had uh, you know led to a lot of uh, uh interesting applications particularly in uh, like a random forest uh you know where very complex data sets like radar images for example were uh, classified analyzed uh, with the help of such tools and machine learning led to self driving cars first tested in 1994 gary kasparov the world champion uh, lost to a computer in 1997 ibm's uh, deep blue supercomputer matched him and uh, overcame gary kasparov and finally a self driving car uh, became a reality in 2009 
and uh, again another ibm supercomputer watson won the game of jeopardy <clears throat> and in a limited in a very limited sense human vision was matched by machines when uh, all these uh, deep networks came about so whatever be the view of an object uh, whatever be the scale orientation uh, color illumination still the the machines were able to recognize with a very high degree of accuracy and this is also supported by advances in hardware so a cluster of uh, many cpus and uh, graphical processing units which made it possible for uh, making a huge number of computations in uh, a very short time <clears throat> and uh, test very complex uh, machine architectures in uh, near real and simultaneously doing big data analytics etc these paradigms also uh, have uh, progress made a huge progress now today we have so many cloud infrastructures whether it is amazon whether it is ibm whether it is google uh, you know so many are available and we have then these software frameworks tensorflow and keras these are only just two examples and simultaneously language programming language developments uh, whether it is matlab toolboxes whether it is python libraries so machine learning is progressing on many fronts uh, because of these simultaneous developments so that is about the history and let us get into some uh, technicalities uh, since you are going to have detailed lectures on uh, many different topics mine will be uh, strictly introductory so let us see since this is a machine learning uh, uh, lecture and the program is on deep learning let's see what is learning and what is a learning algorithm <clears throat> so some of the coming slides had uh, inspiration from one of the nptel courses on machine learning uh, so we are we are familiar with uh, programmed uh, systems for example numerical integration or uh, solution of differential equations many different uh, applications we had these uh, ready to use software so there is a program there is a data we feed it to a, a computer and we see the result we had been very familiar with it for a very long time even in data analysis like classification we had several such uh, systems where the entire data classification is uh, programmed programmable as soon as you have the required data and you can uh, see the result uh, as soon as you have these uh, data supplied to it <clears throat> so you have for example uh, a minimum distance to mean uh, classifier so the moment you supply the uh, labeled uh, data or data the feature okay we'll introduce these terms again but the attributes of the data elements and the classes to which these data elements belong once the data is supplied the computer program would immediately calculate the usable uh, attributes from whatever is given uh, along with the data and then any data could be 
you know, classified and you have a ready result. There was very little to, you know, do beyond, uh, you know, programming according to preset formulae. Whereas the learning based systems had a very different approach. You had the data, okay, for example, in a medical situation, you have the patient's uh, blood chemistry, maybe the, uh, you know, uh, cholesterol, that is lipid profile, uh, all such data. And then you have examples. When you have this kind of data, I mean, this kind of, uh, you know, blood chemistry and this kind of values of uh, cholesterol, creatinine, et cetera, et cetera, mean so-and-so disease, or if it's an ECG, then, you know, uh, this kind of uh, ECG signals mean maybe uh, arrhythmia or uh, tachycardia or it's an angina, uh, an attack, whatever. So the measurements and examples, that is, which measurements, some sample measurements and a corresponding disease. They're supplied and now the machine would actually determine based on this, what should be the boundary in a multidimensional space to distinguish between a healthy person's measurements and a disease affected person's measurements. Okay. So, other than supplying some examples, like, okay, if somebody had this kind of uh, disease, this would be the measurements, okay, the test results, let us say. So, that was all provided. Now, the machine had to figure out how to distinguish between a healthy person and some uh, between person with the disease based on the test results. Now, when a new person's test results are input to it, the machine, after developing a model to distinguish between these people, then uh, it would identify that new person's data as that of a healthy person or that of a person having some health problem. Okay, so you can see the difference here very clearly. <clears throat> so once you have the data, you have all you have ready formulae available through which you can, you know, your computer can do all the computations and the moment you give the new data, you have the result ready. The program itself is taking care of the learning. But here, you have the as attributes, and you have attributes with the examples, okay? And then the machine has to determine where the boundary lies between the healthy person's uh, measurements and the disease affected person's measurements. <clears throat> so that is the uh, important difference between programmed systems and learning based systems. Okay, just to give you an example, let us take a minimum distance to mean classifier that is every class has a mean vector. Now, you have you've supplied a set of uh, say samples and the associated class. So the program will compute the mean for each class from the samples. 
and now the classifier is ready. To supply any new sample, it will compare with the mean vectors of the classes and then output the result straight. And here, the you have say the say blood pressure values, uh, blood sugar values, the other uh, CBC, I mean complete CBC, all such data is available. And then you have, you know, you have a set of these samples uh, along with the qualification that they are, they have a disease or they have no disease. Now, the machine has to determine where uh, things lie, like uh, how to determine the boundary between the a class of healthy people and the people with some disease. You don't have a already formula here. Okay, that how to discriminate between these uh, uh, classes has to be learned by the machine given these examples. <clears throat> so one of the most widely respected definitions of uh, learning is given by Professor Tom Mitchell and uh, Tom Mitchell's machine learning book, I think is used in many universities also. So he says the computer program is said to learn from experience E. So here experience E means some sample data with respect to some class of tasks T and performance measure P. Performance measure means maybe accuracy. If it's performance at tasks in T as measured by P improves with experience E. Okay. So this experience can be features, it can be the labeled uh, samples for us, class of tasks, whatever is the task, whether it is medical diagnosis, whether it is robot navigation, navigation which is self-driving car, identifying land use land cover classes in a satellite image, uh, recognize, recognizing the speech and generating machine translation and in online advertising which ads to be placed when a person is browsing the internet uh, stock market movements currency rate movements so there are these are the kind of tasks okay performance measure p means it is the accuracy how accurately is a disease diagnosed how accurately is the path of a robot uh, laid out, evolved, so that it doesn't bump into any objects, obstacles. How accurately the pixels of a satellite image are classified so that uh, you don't assign uh, a water pixel to a building or uh, a tree or something, okay? So with more features, with more samples, okay, the ability to perform the tasks may improve, okay? And the improvement can be measured by, you know, for each application, the performance may be uh, def uh, denoted or described differently. <coughs> What do we wish to achieve by machine uh, learning? So we want to develop algorithms to learn from data. Obviously, without uh, sample data, uh, without labeled data, the algorithms uh, do not have a starting point. Build models relating the features that characterize the data to the knowledge intended to be derived from data. That is. 
for example i have say the uh, satellite remote sensing data where the reflected energy from ground is captured by uh, sensors in various wavelength bands maybe blue green red near infrared middle infrared thermal infrared etc so the measurements in different wavelengths are the features and if i am giving you a few sample pixels for each class then you characterize the classes okay you model the classes from the given features from the given label the samples and now deploy these models to perform useful tasks for example i can say give me the area of uh, a particular forest or give me the area of uh, the agricultural land uh, tell me the length of the road so i can ask such questions and the system should be able to answer my questions so according to tom michel's definition of uh, learning the machine takes as input the data or the experience and then what task is to be performed and what a priori knowledge you have and then you have to generate a solution and also measure the performance of the whole machine learning system this is what we want to achieve by machine learning <clears throat> so the a priori knowledge can be of different types one is of course the ability to supply sample data about different classes the other is Uh, a particular study area so you may have information that 20% of the area is covered by a reservoir okay 40% of the area is covered by agricultural lands 10% of the area is covered by roads highways and some settlements so like that you are and that 10% 40% 20% etc is sensor independent it is these are facts okay the measurements that is the values associated with the pixels uh, that are part of the image of that area okay and sample pixels correspond with corresponding class labels that will be this one the a priori knowledge tasks to be performed i should be able to classify all the pixels in the image suppose i know from 5% of the image what are the pixels and their corresponding classes the remaining 95% i want to classify okay so i should be able to model the classes in terms of the features then i provide the classification result and performance measure maybe overall accuracy or uh, class wise accuracy whatever i can uh, measure <clears throat> so obviously the machine learning systems are using are they are learning from the prior knowledge and data they are building models and then they are reasoning about the relationship between the features and the classes and then they are able to generalize so input new feature vectors new data vectors and then they are able to assign them to the corresponding classes 
okay here i am mostly talking about machine learning as a classification system you can use it for uh, you know regression and other applications also but i am uh, mostly confining myself to classification machine learning as a classification system so how do you build a machine learning system so you have to choose the data you have to choose the target function so what form would the machine take okay so it can be a set of discriminant functions they can be simple linear discriminants or they can be more complex ones non linear ones and that is choose the type of target function linear non linear and an algorithm to actually find these discriminants okay what are these discriminant functions okay so the way, when we build a machine learning system we would do all these things so a discriminant function gk of x assumes a high value when a sample x belongs to class k okay and when we have uh, a number of these discriminant functions and when a given sample produces the highest response for one of these discriminant functions then we would assign uh, this uh, feature vector or a sample x to the corresponding class okay for which the higher discriminant function produces the highest response okay you can imagine something like this the same data is fed to all the discriminant functions and based on the responses you have a decision so features they are attributes of the data elements based on which you are able to assign the elements to various classes okay so what kind of learning already this is uh, said in an implicit way that we are talking of supervised learning that is you have samples you have the corresponding class labels based on which the machine will model the relationship between the uh, features and the corresponding classes so that any new feature vector when input to the system will be assi assigned to the appropriate class or given the appropriate class label and when access is not there to such knowledge then the data are grouped based on similarity of the feature vectors into clusters okay and uh, then you have to later identify what each cluster represents okay we just have the feature vectors that is attributes but not the corresponding labels so you have the pixel values in blue green red infrared etc but i am not telling you uh uh a particular set of values belong to water or dry soil or rocky areas etc i'm not telling you that i'm just saying that the values are like some uh, reflectance value in blue green red infrared etc that's all i'm telling you so in that case what you do is there is an implicit assumption that similar valued pixels also occur spatially adjacent to each other and so if you are able to group the similar valued pixels then there is a very good chance that they will correspond to some real life objects so the first thing you do is you form these clusters based on 
statistical or numerical similarity. Reinforcement learning, we are not going to talk about it. It's based on some kind of a reward punishment approach. That is when you have uh, an agent uh, which is performing some tasks in a given environment. <clears throat> One of the practical difficulties is to have these labeled data uh, in every case, particularly when you have a time series. That is, let's say in a crop cycle, in case of uh, agriculture, Suppose 10 images are taken over a four month period. And you have these labeled samples collected by actually going to the field, uh, maybe four times. The remaining six times, you haven't gone to the field, so you don't have the actual data. So you have partial you know, ground truth data or partially labeled data, whatever you want to say. So based on that partial knowledge, you have to come up with suitable measures to uh, perform supervised classification of the entire data. So it is partially supervised learning. Again, we won't say much about it. Let's see an example from satellite uh, imaging. <clears throat> so usually the proportion of uh, the pixels or data elements that you want to supply as a prototype or labeled samples for each category is governed by the statistical uh, theory of uh, sampling, okay? So the mathematical theory of sampling, uh, you know, it looks at the properties of the total population and lays down the conditions of what should be the size of the sample and how it should be collected so that there is no human bias, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, this sampling is something that the medical community uses very regularly to come up with uh, you know which medication helps in which treatment which uh, you know test results are often associated with which disease so a lot of sampling based uh, you know decision making or rules sampling based evolution of rules you know they they are very common okay in many applications and we have elections in the country so as soon as the polling is over we are going to see the predictions so how are these predictions made the polling companies organizations are not going to meet every voter uh, to come up with the predictions. They, they make a sample of the total uh, voting public and based on the responses they get from the sample of uh, voters, they then uh, actually decide uh, whom to... Uh, I mean, uh, they then they then predict rather who are likely to be the uh, winners in the election. In, in case of uh, imaging, you have examples like okay, so a small area is marked for each class. So this is like the sample for water class. This is the sample for mangroves class, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And you can think of other examples from other disciplines. Uh, 
<coughs> so what what does the classifier compute from directly so what does the classifier compute from training samples okay forget this word directly it can compute for example the mean vector for each class the covariance matrix min max levels etc cetera, etc cetera. okay it computes these things and what it can learn class boundaries separating the classes and these boundaries may be hyperplanes if their data are linearly separable or more complex surfaces so what are the parameters of these hyperplanes or these complex surfaces they have to be learned from the data and these can be computed from the data so you can think of a simple programmed classifier like the maximum likelihood classifier that is very widely used by the remote sensing community so here you have a set of pixels from a satellite image uh and associated class label are given each pixel actually is a vector of multiple features and so the task is to determine the likelihood of a particular class given the feature vector okay so probability of class ci given the feature vector x so whichever probability of i is highest i equal to 1 to n x is assigned to that class this is the actual decision rule okay so in order to compute this the bayes theorem is used and this is expressed in these in this form which is fairly well known and the denominator can be safely ignored because this is common to all classes right so you can say instead this is proportional to this ignoring the denominator okay so if you are able to say that probability of cj given x is the max maximum of probability of ci given x for all i then x is assigned to class cj okay now here we have a prior probability which is measurement independent and this is a distribution of measurements given the class okay so suppose you you said okay take these pixels they all belong to the forest class let us say okay then what is the distribution of these measurements multi dimensional probability density function you can say multivariate probability density function this is actually this should be probability of x given ci class conditional probability density function of the features okay you can ignore this anyway and in practical situation this is considered to be gaussian and uh, so express this as a multivariate gaussian and in order to use the exponentials etc we use logarithms so since we all we want is a ranking probability of c1 given x c2 given x c3 given x etc and logarithm being a monotonous uh, function log probability of ci given x is proportional to log probability of x given ci plus log probability of ci okay we are ignoring this okay so this quantity if we assume to be multivariate gaussian after taking the logarithm we have only addition and addition subtractions whatever so we have a discriminant for each class like this so as you can see everything is clearly programmable the moment i have a set of samples for each class i can find the mean vector 
I can find a covariance matrix. And I'm also given this data. So everything is programmed and any new sample X, I can input to all these discriminant functions, G1, X, G2, X, et cetera, and see which one is the highest and assign that sample to that class, okay? So this is the example for a purely programmable classifier. Everything is known given the samples. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> we have a learning-based classifier. Let us look at the support vector machine. Now, all I'm given is these samples. Now, how do I separate them into classes? How does a classifier learn where to place the boundary between the two? I'm not assuming any Gaussianity of the features, anything, okay? So I'm not making any such parametric assumptions. All I'm given are these samples. Okay, this is class one, this is class two. So I can place a boundary here. I'll separate these samples with 100% accuracy. This also will work, this also will work. And all of these will work, okay? These slides, many of you, if you are teaching machine learning, support vector machines, you would know that they are originally prepared by uh, Professor Andrew Moore. I think at Cornell University. So among all these, which one is the best? Okay. The machine learning system is trying to learn where to place the boundary so that you get the maximum benefit out of it. So one is separating the samples into classes. And the other thing is, since the actual data <coughs> may include not only these samples, but a lot of other data, can we provide some buffer for other data to vary okay, beyond what these samples are representing and still be correctly assigned to the classes, okay? So as you can see, let us say this is feature one and this is feature two. And if feature one value increases slightly, this particular sample can go to the wrong class. And if feature one value decreases slightly, this sample can go to the wrong class, okay? So there's very little, very little margin if the discriminant is placed like this. Whereas if it is placed like this, you have relatively more margin for the values to vary and still stay in the correct class, okay? So can you place the boundary in such a way that you have the maximum margin for the benefit of the test samples or new samples, okay? Because if the data, if this is all the data, you don't need to worry at all. <clears throat> Any of these will do the job, but you should anticipate that there will be other data belonging to this class as well as this class whose values may come may go to the right here, to the left here, and you want to make sure that they stay in the correct class. So you want to place the boundary in such a way that there is maximum margin for the new samples to vary and still be correctly classified, okay? So the system has to learn where to place it. So there is, an optimization problem here, that is this margin is to be maximized. So how do you get the margin? Wherever the discriminant is, the distance to the nearest samples is the margin. The faraway samples don't matter. Only the nearest ones, because these are the ones that are likely to be misclassified. So they provide the region of validity 
for the function representing this discriminant. So these are the supports and we are dealing with multidimensional data. So support vectors and the classifier based on this is the support vector machine. That is how the nomenclature came about. Okay, so we have the learning system. Find the nearest samples or find the distance to any sample and the margin is given by the smallest distance between a given discriminant and the samples. So if you have the discriminant, then over all these samples, you know, you compute the margin. Now you want to maximize it. So maximize it by varying the parameters of this. So if it's a line, the slope and intercept. So you can have it in multidimensional uh, case, maybe plane, hyperplane, etc. Okay, so how do you tune the parameters of this so that this margin is maximized? So for every WB, you have certain margin. So for which WB, you have the highest margin. This is to be learned from these samples. So it's an optimization problem. Why, why is it an optimization problem? You are trying to maximize something. And what are the constraints here? Wherever you place it, you make sure that these samples are put in one class and these samples are put in the other class. So it's a constrained optimization, okay? So it can be seen that this is a constrained quadratic optimization and there are many tools available to uh, take care of the optimization. Okay, and we have remote sensing examples. And the other one, multi-layer perceptron, <clears throat> again, you are uh, familiar with this. As many input features you have, that many elements here to capture the, uh, to store the input features. And then you have other compute elements, which are the individual perceptrons. And then at the end, you have another set of perceptrons whose output will be the output of the entire classifier itself. So between the nodes at any, let's call these layers. So this is an input layer where you supply the input features. You know how many should be there. And these are the intermediate ones that are hidden from the end user. So they are, in practice, they are called hidden layers of uh, neurons and you have the output layer where you can observe what is the classification result, okay? So if a particular feature vector should belong to class three, there will be very, ideally there should be zero response here, zero response here, a response of 100% here, and again, no response here, okay? So, so it is not indicated in this picture here, but there are link weights connecting nodes of one layer to the nodes of the subsequent layers. So what should be the correct weights all over so that when you supply the inputs, you get the correct response at the output layer. So this is the problem of multi-layer perceptron where what are you optimizing here? You're optimizing the correct, uh, you're searching for the correct solution, correct result, okay, when you're given giving the input. So the, whatever is the likely error, you're trying to minimize it. Okay, so the entire knowledge relating the inputs to the output classes lies in all the 
connection weight. So each of these arrows carries a connection weight. And so if you have the correct set of connection weights, when you are supplying the inputs, you'll get the correct output classes. Okay, so what are you minimizing? For a single input sample, you have the error. So if you keep minimizing, if you keep correcting the link weights according to this error, we call it online learning. Or if you accumulate the error over all the training samples and then correct the link weights according to this error, we call it batch learning, okay? So some people say online learning is better and some people say batch learning is better, but uh, in the practical examples where I had used the neural network, I used the online learning. This performed better than batch learning. Okay, so whatever data you feed, it goes from the input layer towards the output layer. And whatever error is observed at the output layer, it is propagated back. And in the process, all the connection weights are adjusted. <clears throat> So how are the weights adjusted? You go according to the negative of the error gradient as a function of the link weights, okay? So had it been a maximization problem, you want to move towards a peak, but if it's a minimization problem, you want to move towards the valley in this multidimensional surface. So you can again see applications. So this is a texture feature-based uh, classification. So these are the kind of things that you would do. Okay, so this is satellite image. We define the neural network. We supplied samples for each class. And then the network was trained. And then every pixel in the image was assign these labels by the classifier. I had a simple grayscale image. I had to classify it. So the gray level alone is not enough. So the built up areas, the less, uh, you know, built up areas, the water uh, channels, Okay, the coastal waters, the deep waters, so they are all texturally different. And so some texture features were derived and added to the input data to build up a bigger feature vector. And based on that, a classification was performed using the same network. More recent developments. Okay, I'm about to close uh, my talk because I think uh, I must have already come to the end of the time. In about five minutes, I'll stop now. <clears throat> so where the simple user supplied features are not enough for uh, generalizing to the extent that a human is able to generalize the Supplied features may not be enough. There may be lots of uh, uh, major and minor features that we are not capturing by our own uh, approaches. So the capability of such systems will again be fairly limited in the traditional machine learning approaches. So the more recent developments are that the machine should generalize as far as possible, as well as humans. So that is the uh, motivation. And again, the idea is to throw a huge amount of computing power, make no bargains, no compromises with the size of the uh, labeled data, 
the number of features, the number of output classes, let them be as big as uh, it could, they could get, no problem, but you should try to generalize whether the input is a highly rotated version, scaled version, or the illumination, everything is such that it is look it looks very much different from the original whatever be the case the machine should be able to generalize and recognize things okay that is the motivation and deep learning architectures are introduced essentially for this purpose okay so in speech and natural language processing they have achieved a fair bit of success but in vision they are still uh, sort of limited, not they did not come up uh, to completely overtake the humans. <clears throat> okay, so that is uh, so we have the convolution neural networks, they are one example of. Uh, you know, deep learning system because through different convolutional filters, the features are extracted by the system itself. Okay, this is fully connected network. There are a lot of redundant connections and the convolutional filters, they only capture, since for pixels in the images, the related information lies only in the immediate neighborhoods connecting every pixel to every other pixel makes very little sense okay on, on that basis the small neighborhood based convolutional filters are employed to derive the requisite features okay so at once initially you derive maybe the local intensity differences or uh, you filter out the noise in the data. So then from these next level, when you try to derive further information from these, you may get textures, then you may get objects and then interconnections. So many things you may get by deriving features from different stages where each stage comes from applying these convolutional filters on the previous stage. So convolutional neural networks are just one example of a deep learning system. Convolution group, uh, the convolutional results, repeat and so on. And then finally you form a big feature vector that you supply to a neural network and which performs the classification, okay. <clears throat> so we can ignore these results. And there are so many popular variants, one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional, and then you have auto encoders, And uh, Dr. Arun, I think, can recognize these things because I have pinched them from his PhD work. <clears throat> so if I have a lower resolution version of an image, can I generate a, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, this is the lower resolution version of an image. Can I generate a higher resolution version of it using deep learning methods, okay? So the model actually learns by comparing with the supplied high resolution version and the low resolution version. And by generating this result, find the error difference with this 
and then adjust its parameters. So that way, ultimately, at some point, given this, a close approximation of this is generated. Okay. So even if this is not as good as this, this is definitely much better than this. Okay. So this is an application of deep learning for super resolution. More examples like this. Now, sometimes if a satellite is capturing images of the ground, but a pixel's instantaneous field of view is say 20 meters in length and 20 meters in breadth, so 400 square meters. A single pixel is covering so much area on the ground. Is it possible that you can see what is there inside these 400 square meters? Because in India, at least 400 square meters or 900 square meters, a plot like this may contain so many different things. We hardly have open spaces. So uh, it may have a piece of a road, it may have a tree. Okay, it, it may have different things. So can you see inside a pixel? Can you identify the classes? Not at a full pixel level, but a sub pixel level. Okay. So this is a kind of super resolution, but resolution super resolving at a classification level, not at the pixel intensity color level. Okay. This is also another application where the uh, remote sensing community could successfully use deep learning. So you have uh, several examples. And target detection, we have various uh, uh, convolutional neural nets for target identification. This is an example of it. Okay, RCNN, uh, you might have heard of it, region convolutional neural net, and you have various versions of it today, a wide range of them, simple RCNN, fast, faster, and then you have uh, YOLO, you only look once, you only look twice, their versions. So, so many uh, deep learning applications are there for detecting objects based on their shape and size and things like that. Okay, so I want to close this presentation with this statement. The success of machine learning depends on three key factors, reliable and adequate training data, features that adequately represent the classes and a learning algorithm that can fully capture the characteristics of the classes from the features and the training data so that it can generalize well. So if you don't have enough training data, if the number of features are not enough, or if you have a very weak learning algorithm, your machine learning exercise will not be successful. Okay, so if you want to build a, a powerful, successful machine learning system, you have to pay attention to all of them. That's the final message. Thank you very much. And I stop here. Thank you uh, very much, sir, for the kind words.